Uh, my name is Katie Fraser. I am at the National Research Council in the Text Analytics Group, and it is my great pleasure to be chairing the third session of the day. Um, I'd like to introduce to you our second keynote speaker, Alison Paprisa. Dr. Paprisa is the Vice President of Health Strategy and Partnerships at the Vector Institute in Toronto, leading health strategy and overseeing health research collaborations, health data partnerships, and health AI application projects. She also leads workshops and courses focused on the leadership and management of research at the University of Toronto, where she is an assistant professor. She has previously held senior roles at the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and Ontario's Health Ministry and worked for seven years in multinational pharmaceutical R&D. Today, she will be discussing social license, health data, and AI. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Alison Paprisa. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, so I'm Allison. My legal name is P. Allison Paprisa. You'll see later something comes into Patricia Paprisa, uh, which is why. Um, and as I put on this first slide, I'm, I'm here in a few different roles. Uh, primarily, I'd say, as the VP of Health Strategy and Partnerships at the Vector Institute, but also with the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences and the University of Toronto. So I apologize. My slides are a bit of a dog's breakfast as I've you know, compiled them from different sources. And you may notice the transition as we go from the slick vector slides to some that include artwork by my teenage daughter. It might be noticeable. <laughs> So in terms of, and I've reflected during the presentations this morning, you know, my, my main hope for today is to um, hopefully get your buy-in that ethical AI really is AI that's founded on responsible use of appropriate data. And ideally, these will be data that have minimal bias relative to the task you're trying to accomplish with them. So for example, if our task is to have a predictive model for publicly funded health services in the province of Ontario, a great data set would be non-consented population-wide data for all publicly funded services. But in getting the advantage of working with this population-wide data, we also have to acknowledge we're talking about secondary use. This is use of the data for purposes that weren't intended, and that always unavoidably carries both benefits and risks. We pursue it for the benefits, but there are risks, including risks to privacy, and there are risks in terms of you know, growing inequity, reinforcing human biases, all these kinds of things. So when it comes to the AI and the data that we're going to pursue, we really can't be making those risk versus benefit assessments on our own. If we're going to be responsible and ethical in our AI, we need to engage with members of the public and involve them so we can get a sense of what are the risks and benefits, the priorities from their perspective, and under what conditions do they want us using these data for what purposes. And it's through that engagement and through transparency, ultimately, that we're going to build and maintain trust. And that, I believe, is the foundation for everything, including economic prosperity from AI, because that's when you have really high quality, sustainable, and ethical AI. I agree with Anne Kabukian. There's no forced choice between you know, privacy and, and security. But I would add to that that we can't determine it on our own, no matter how hard we try. So the overview of the talk, very briefly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Vector Institute and some of the work we do uh, related to ethics there. What I'm presenting today is just a small portion of it. I'm going to present the results of an ISIS qualitative study, ICS qualitative study, that was focused on learning more about how the general public feels about use of this population-wide health data. We're going to have some fun. We're going to do some live so polling about health AI scenarios, which is why I've asked people to connect to the Wi-Fi. Um, this is just to prompt thinking. This is not a study. You might feel uncomfortable. Don't worry. It's just to get some conversation going and then talk a little bit about where this could go. And a lot of that really is more about stuff that would be done at U of T. It's uh, you know, some experimental exploratory stuff. So let's begin with Vector. And I'm happy to include this, because uh, I, I, it hasn't come up today. I mean, we're very pleased to be part of the pan-Canadian AI strategy. So as you may know, Canada was the first country to have a national AI strategy. It's now, unfortunately, a little small in dollars compared to some other places. We'll see what we can do about that. And there are three sites. You heard uh, Joelle Pinot from uh, Mila in Montreal, uh, Amy, Alberta, Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute in Edmonton, and the Vector Institute in Toronto. And we work together as a team. Canada is a small enough country. We don't compete with each other, except maybe we compete a little trying to recruit top faculty. But we have weekly conference calls, and, and by design, we'll work together on this. 
uh, our main uh, academic affiliations are with the University of Toronto, University of Waterloo, and our federal funding comes through CIFAR, Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Our vision and mission is a little unusual, for those of you not from Canada, I mean, in that we are really looking to be absolutely world-class global excellence. And sometimes in Canada, I can say this as someone who's worked at the interface of R&D and policy for many years, uh, sometimes maybe we, we don't act like that's in grasp. It, it is within grasp. We are realizing that potential to be world-leading. And in particular at Vector, we focus on uh, deep learning and machine learning. We're a little unusual than research institutes that I've worked with in the past in that we have a strong tie to industry right from the start, and a big part of our mandate is about attracting and retaining talent, not just leading research talent, but a workforce that will help support industry. And we have grown like crazy. So this is March 2017. Um, there was an announcement, there was a promise of some money, and there was uh, some space purchased in the Mars building, and less than one year later, uh, this is what we looked like. And now, coming on two years since that announcement, with no people, just some money and a, a space, uh, we've grown to, grown to be a community of over 230 researchers, 26 faculty members, I think this is out of date, we're up to 27, uh, 63 faculty affiliates, postgrad affiliates, and a large number of students, and that's part of the model. You have some highly, highly talented people, you offer them a supportive and flexible environment, and then a large number of trainees under them, you know, help spread the benefits of AI. What we do? It started with sort of anti-brain drain, world-class research, giving people a reason to stay in Canada, being part of a community. But from the very start, we've worked closely with industry. We have uh, about $135 million worth of funding, and it, roughly it breaks down a third, a third, a third. A third of that comes from industry sponsors. So these are large consulting firms, big banks, people who are saying to us, we need talent. We want more AI in the work that we do. We do quite a lot on training and education. I'm going to make reference soon to the, uh, a program we have that has the goal of graduating 1,000 AI-related master's students per year within five years, so dramatically increasing the workforce. And then interestingly, health is the one area where right from the start it's been part of our mandate. And this comes from our provincial government funding. So it's not that our researchers don't work in other places. A lot of the work that they do is foundational, you know, new ML, uh, deep learning methods, etc. But from the very start we've said we think AI can make a difference in health and we want to make a difference there. And you'll see the very last billet, part of how we do that is we really get involved when there's a potential for multi-site and even multi you know, cross-provincial or, or multi-province data infrastructure. Because the bigger we can get those data sets, the more representative they are, uh, the less biased they're likely to be, and, and the more it's like a strong foundation for good AI. So a few examples of the work that we do at Vector that's related to ethics. And I wanted just to underscore what I'm presenting here is just a portion of that. Uh, I mentioned our uh, 1,000 AI master's programs. So there are only five requirements for any program to be recognized by Vector. And part of the work here you'll appreciate was just about helping students to understand which programs had AI in it, because you could do a master's of engineering that had like a research thesis in machine learning, and you could do a master's of engineering that had nothing to do with machine learning. So you know, how can students tell the difference? How can employers tell the difference? So we pulled together a great working group that came up with a total of five requirements, and one of them is that there must be learning outcomes related to ethics, AI, and society. And the reason it's written that way as opposed to a course is we've said, look, you can integrate it across courses, it can be a module in many different courses, you can do it in different ways, but you must meet that requirement. And to date, we've got 15 recognized programs across Ontario that all will be meeting this requirement. Uh, many of you in the room may know, uh, you know, the excellent research that goes on in Vector. So Rich Semmel, our uh, research director for the whole institute, has a whole program around fairness in machine learning. Anna Goldenberg, who is associate research director health, is working on an international project called Generation AI, which among other things is looking at the fact that, you know, parents post a lot about their children with illnesses and, you know, how th might this affect children down the road. And she's actually just brought in our first ethics-focused postdoc. And Frank Rudchich does a lot including international work around standards and safety and health AI, in particular looking at things like reward hacking that might not be obvious to regulators but could be real safety concerns. 
We participate and partner in many ethics-focused events. You're going to hear from my colleague Jennifer Gibson, who was really pleased to be involved in the Ethics and AI for Good Health uh, initiative that she set up in June. Um, UHN, University Health Network, largest research hospital in Canada. Uh, we did a panel with them on social license, and some of the polling I'm going to do today was from that. And then things like CIFAR and CIHR, AI for Public Health Equity uh, seminar. And then finally, this is mostly what I'm going to talk about, you know, right in our, our health strategy, we've got there this commitment that when it comes to data and how we approach data, we're going to be bringing in the patient perspective in order to make sure that we do it in a responsible way, our data investments. Because the opportunity, we think, is this, that, that AI and machine learning unavoidably are going to reflect the characteristics of the data sets that you use for model development and training. And though we are a small country, because we have uh, single-payer systems for health and social services, you know, we have some data assets that could be really valuable. Marja Gassimi, one of our faculty who's recently, we've recruited her from MIT, we're so pleased to have her. She's done a lot of work with the MIMIC data set in the U.S. And she goes public, she says, look, I want my model for heart failure to be based on Ontario data, not data out of one hospital in Boston that's mostly on men. You know, so that's the opportunity that we have. Um, handled correctly, because we've now got this critical mass of AI researchers interested in working with the data. And it can be a foundation for benefits, you know, not just here, but because of the ethnically diverse population around the world. There are, th there are new knowledge we can generate here that will be very important. But to realize the benefits of these public data, we need, really need to understand and respond to the priorities and concerns of the, the people, <laughs> data subjects, who provide the data in the first place. Which brings us to the topic uh, today, social license and the use of health data for AI. So social license, for I, I was so pleased to hear it mentioned uh, you know, right in the opening remarks. Uh, for those who aren't aware, it's not a formal agreement. It's not something that you get on paper that you know, you're allowed to do something. It's an informal understanding between a community and a stakeholder to undertake certain activities. And the interesting thing about social license is those organizations that hold it might not even know that they hold it until it, something happens and it's withdrawn and you realize, oh, you know, we, we no longer have support to do this. It's not about the legal uh, elements of it. Uh, someone called it the court of public opinion. It's, it's you know, what the public's going to support. It's actually been used a lot in Canada. I, I actually was reintroduced to it, interestingly, through colleagues in the UK. Um, but it's been used a lot in Canada when in like mining and natural resources. So the idea being that, you know, a community might welcome someone who's coming in to do some natural resource extraction to a point. There would be jobs and benefits. But if the company goes too far uh, in terms of damage to the environment, or if there's a perception that the company is just going to be in there, you know, destroy the land and get out, you can face extreme resistance, and I, I love this quote here. It's like, you know, and if it's withdrawn, um, you can, it becomes obvious to everyone incurring both human and economic costs that can be irreparable. So this is something we really want to get right. And more recently, people have been using it to talk about health data, data intensive research generally, and I think it's applicable to AI. I hope you agree. So, well, this is, this is one of the first references in the literature. So the folks from the UK, whoever they are, are nodding. So care.data, massive investment in getting NHS data out so it could have health and economic benefits, it was put on CDs, and it went out to companies. And there was a huge amount of communication about this, but in hindsight, um, you know, clearly it wasn't the right one. Uh, people uh, were concerned that the, the communication that was intended to reach the public ended up being mixed up with pizza flyers, for example. People just didn't realize what was happening until it became a news story. And then, as you can see here, the impact was that they actually decided to shut it down, and not just that, but they introduced a new opt-out model for sharing patient data. So huge impacts, including outside the health data sphere for other practices that rely on data. And so this quote is a perfect one, poorly informed understanding of the social license for the secondary use of personal medical data that care.data, and these are very smart people that they'd proposed. Um, they didn't realize that that legal authority wasn't enough to allow them to operate in the way that they wanted to. And so as I've learned about this, I've kind of come to understand it like this. Th there's a difference between what's legal and what's within social license. So th if this is, you know, everything that's legal wherever you are, then this might be within social license. This is how I first started to think about it. 
But then as I talk to people about some of the things that they'd like to do with health data as my background in particular, but data generally, I realize like, actually, no, it's kind of more like this, right? Like there are actually things that the public thinks we're doing with public data that are not legally allowed in terms of data sharing. And moreover, there, there's some reason to believe that this is something that varies by jurisdiction. So the link here is active. We got a group of people together. It was, albeit for a different purpose, it was talking about using medical databases and clinical trials. But in Denmark, where for hundreds of years they've had these registries of data, I mean, a researcher will go directly to a person and say, hey, you've got diabetes, would you like to be in a study? And the person will say, yeah, you know, I would. Whereas in Scotland, they make a point of having being someone in the circle of care who the person would reasonably expect to have access to their data. So that's not coded anywhere. It's just, you know, what's acceptable. So with all of that, and this is the ICS work, we thought, you know what, as an organization that's a steward of data covering all publicly funded health services for the whole population, we better find out what people here think about how their data are used. So uh, we conducted a series of eight focus groups, uh, four in downtown Toronto, four in northern locations. The goal was to have eight to ten for each. They were uh, two separate Research Ethics Board approved qualitative studies, first in 2015. And in 2015, we found, I think, relevant to this room, that people cared about private sector uses in particular. So we did a lot of work creating what we hope are really balanced scenarios about how private sector might want to work with data. Went back and did a second round of focus groups. We had them professionally moderated by Ipsos behind a one-way mirror. We actually tried to do some recruiting on our own, but found disproportionately we tended to get older, educated women, and we, we wanted a, a more representative approach. We've since learned about other resources that might help with that. And generally, these were about two hours. We started with a little information about ICS, you know, the processes used to protect privacy, et cetera, um, and then went on to the specific scenarios. So now I'm going to take you through some of the findings. So the first is, the first blush reaction to the secondary use of health data for research, like this, they're saying, oh, it's a not-for-profit research institute, has data for the whole population, it was kind of like this, you know, <laughs> really? <laughs> it wasn't yay, it was like, really? And despite the fact that these ICS, literally hundreds of publications per year, you know, top journals, international news coverage, so despite there is a ton of media coverage, People hadn't heard of ICS, and that made some of them suspicious. So things like, are you doing this right now? The, the last one, why are you coming out of the shadows? It's like, no, it's in the New York Times. There's no shadow. <laughs> you know. We're, so the point being, you know, this is, no one's, people are trying to be transparent, but still the public is not aware, and as a result, it affects their trust. Literally, privacy and security go together in the same sentences. So I mentioned at the start, that if my privacy would be secure, then I'm for it, you know, question one. The ICS people, they're trained in privacy and security, that's reassuring to me. They appreciated the fact that identifying information was removed, you know, people focus on the name. But for many, that wasn't enough. There are these hackers out there, you know, there was references to CRA being hacked. So people would say, you know, we, we get, we get that you're trying to protect the, our privacy. However, if a bank can get hacked, if CRA can get hacked, maybe you can get hacked too. External oversight meant a lot. This was interesting because this was just, I think, maybe one or two sentences in the background information that we provided. So for the consortium of industry people coming together, this might be some food for thought. We, we literally just mentioned the Information Privacy Commissioner of Ontario. But the number of times it came back to us in the comments about why people were supportive was surprising. They really liked that it wasn't just someone within the organization saying, yeah, you're doing great, that there was an external body. And this is a big one for us to grapple with because really, in contrast with open data principles, they preferred models that had fewer users. And I think this is really relevant for AI because you know, for, for the machine learning researchers to do the work that they want to do, they need to be working with record level data. It's not synthetic data, you know, it's detailed data. But people would say things in addition to the quotes here, they'd say like, I don't, I don't care what you have in place. I think there's less risk if you send someone a PDF report than if you give them access to the data. And they have a point. So this is my last one, this sort of generic uh, health research things. Um, 
we presented in, in 2017 three scenarios in random order. All of them involved the private sector. We were particularly interested in, in what you know, private sector uses might be supported. And so if we, we generally think of them in the form of researchers would study X to find out Y, you know, study a population, study something to find out a certain thing. If we said we want to study a drug to find out its long-term safety and effectiveness using this population-wide data, pretty much across the board everyone said, yes, we agree. This is one of these, like, I thought you were doing that already. If there was a dangerous drug, wouldn't you know, right? If we said we wanted to study a condition to learn more about the health services utilizations and costs for it, and all these scenarios are in the public domain, you can actually look at them. Um, yeah, people were okay with that too. There was maybe a little bit of skepticism, so this would be like a private sector company studying an infection, the impact of an infection generally. It was actually C. difficile, and they have products for C. difficile, but it's not like they'd be the only one who would benefit. They were okay with that. But when it was perceived as a study who would study, that would study people, in this case, who do not adhere to prescription medications to identify incentives and strategies to increase adherence, then several participants had reservations. That's broad and scary. That's big brother. Even these are, these are not identified people. Um, there was another comment about concern that uh, results from studies could disadvantage certain groups. Like you're going to find out that seniors are very expensive and maybe it's just easier for you not to you know, pay for the services for seniors anymore. And I, I highlight this a bit because this is one that took the researchers by surprise because to the researchers, these were all very similar studies in some ways, right? It was, it was a data set and it was a specific outcome that they were looking at and it was similar methods. But from the public's perspective, they were quite different. So what might this mean for AI uh, uses of health data? Well, the, the first thing is we don't know, right? We, we just know that, honestly, it was really informative. We were surprised by some of what we heard. And we want to find out more, and that's part of the future goal. But, you know, again, let's have a little fun. Check the time. Oh. Um, let's see what we in this room think about some fictional health AI examples. So we'll just quickly go through some polls. You're going to get a one-line description of a scenario. You're going to feel like, I can't answer this. Just go with your inclination. It's a forced choice. Yes or no, is it within social license? So yes would be like, I'm inclined to think it is. If I, you know, I, I want to check the details, but I'm inclined to think it is. And no is like, I'm inclined to think this is not within social license. You would really need to bring some new evidence to the table to convince me that it is. Is it within social license for three hospitals to pool their patient level data so they can develop a more accurate AI model to predict which patients are likely to have poor outcomes post-discharge? Okay, so this is one of those things where, this is only the second time we've used it, but most people will be like, yeah, that's an appropriate thing for people to do. You know, you'd have limited accuracy with your own data. Turns out this is uh, at least constrained, if not prohibited, under PHIPA right now. So uh, within social license, outside of the law. Is it within social license for a hospital to create a spin-off firm that uses AI applied to the hospital's medical images for early prediction of osteoporosis? Okay, so most think no. There's no right or wrong answer, yeah. <laughs> Just curious what people think. Okay, here's another one. An AI firm works with record level patient data to optimize patient flow at a hospital at no cost in exchange for the ability to commercialize the technology. Is this within social license? Oh, okay. I'm, Katie's giving me the sign, I've gone over. Okay, so we're just going to move on. A pharmaceutical firm works the product line focused on mental health. They want to partner with a hospital to apply AI to identify genetic biomarkers. Is this within social license? Very interesting. So incidentally, across the board, we're more no than the hospital uh, <laughs> innovation group. <laughs> And our last one, an insurance company wants to partner with a hospital to study the characteristics of people who recover most quickly and completely. <laughs> insurance, see, that's the thing. I know, as soon as insurance comes up, people just assume it will never work to their benefit. Wow, okay. <laughs> and I'll just leave this poll open. We'll switch back to the presentation. But if there are other scenarios that you feel we should be asking people about, uh, 
please enter them and other thoughts that you have. So I've emphasized the privacy and security results, but I, I just wanted like at a high level to say what we know from the data intensive health research focus groups generally. I mean, people need assurance about privacy and security. They appreciate external oversight. There is actually general support, you know, in contrast with the news story, there's general support, but with conditions. We have this new theme we hadn't seen before that the public see data as an asset that should be used provided their concerns are addressed. There's mixed and more negative reaction when we talk about private sector involvement, but again, it's not across the board, no, it's more about under what conditions. People want to see some reciprocity and benefit sharing. So we're going to do more of this, including some, some AI scenarios. We haven't done any AI scenarios. And why do we need to do this? Well, this, this, you know, I didn't have to look for this. This was yesterday. This was the headline yesterday. Medical record software companies are selling your health data. So you don't know it. You go to the doctor. Your data is being sold. And funnily enough, the last time I used these, this poll, it was like a couple of days after StatCan in the bank. You know, people care about this. It's important that we get it right. And then also, I didn't even have to look for this. I got from PayPal my, my notice of policy updates, which infuriated me. It's just like, there's been a change. Click here. You know, they could tell me what the change is. And then when I click here, this is what I get. No joke. And then you can see the blue font. I'm like, oh, did I cut and paste twice to view it? No, what they did is they actually had the old one and the new one side by side. So that's like 30 pages worth of text. Come on. So future work. More research into public use of AI use, uh, AI uses of data. Realistic scenarios, I'm, I'm not about the fantasy land, I'm not about so negative you'd never approve it. Realistic so that we can find out how people feel about it and under what conditions they might support it and then respect their wishes. Make our interdisciplinary work on public engagement even more interdisciplinary. I'm really enthusiastic about the potential to bring in inclusive design, risk communication, um, arts-based approaches to sharing information with people as opposed to making them sit for two hours to sort of get like a mini lecture on data first. And then this idea of notches on the dial. Maybe we're just mixing too much together. You know, like if a company says to me they use data to improve products and services, I'm okay with that. It's just that I want to know if they sell my data to somebody else, right? And in particular, I want to know about the non-consented data. We have to handle that in a very trustworthy manner if we want to preserve our ability to work with it. Because there are things like the opioid epidemic, we rely on non-consented data. GDPR doesn't emphasize non-consented data, but it's allowed under there. So we need to be transparent about when we are using non-consented data. So this is, this is my vision. <laughs> this is the, uh, the, the other policy update from ACME, completely fictional. At ACME, we use your data to improve our products and services. A hundred of our people have access to it in identified form. I totally made this up. Don't take a picture of that because <laughs> draft, one night of thinking by one person. <laughs> But this is the kind of thing that if we work with members of the public and find out from them what's important, I mean, we can communicate this. We don't need the 30 pages. Well, maybe the 30 pages is back up, but we can do better. It's not that hard. Because we do have this fantastic opportunity, as Nav Navdeep Bain's minister says. But if we're going to make the most of it, citizens have to trust what we're doing with data. And so the last, the closing statement, I had the privilege to be involved in this UK-led work, a consensus statement on public involvement and engagement with data-intensive health research. And the key premise is the public isn't something to work around, right? You involve them, and that's how it becomes as good and strong as it can be. And I say, you know, why not just do this? <laughs> Let's bring them into AI, and that's how we're going to get the best AI research and application for all. Thank you. <laughs>